All right, everybody, and welcome to the Nine Years podcast. You're listening to the voice of Nick Draper, and I'm joined, as always, by the face of the BBC Sport website, Mr. Stuart Deacons. And listeners, well, we've got lots of things to talk about. Stu will know, Stu's laughing because we've been talking pre-recording about my rants about the world as it is right now. And I am, yes, I'm going to try and put a little nip for this podcast, Stu, and be a little bit more (laughs) measured. Um, But so much in the modern world is so shockingly shit, it doesn't half wind you up at times. But anyway, let's be more positive. Let's be more positive. Let's start with our shout out this week. And we're going to go straight in with the under 18s who won silverware by winning away at Rotherham United on Tuesday evening with, um, well, with, sorry, that's the wrong term to use, winning a competition that was actually from 2019-20, but COVID measures meant that it was played in November 2021. But Stu, it is the, remind me, it's like the Southern Youth Alliance Cup yeah, it's the Youth Alliance, uh, yeah, Youth Alliance League Cup, I think, the league. Right. Yeah, it basically, you, it's a regional, it's regional south and north. Um, we went through, well, we won through, I can't remember, to be fair, so long ago, I can't remember who we beat in the actual um, No, I can't, final. I, remember getting to the, I remember getting to the final, I can't remember who we beat, that's really bad. Yeah, I think, um, I think, top of my head thinks Oxford, but I might be wrong. Um, Rotherham beat Fleetwood in there regional final, which then meant um, we faced each other with having due back in March, um, but then was rescheduled. It's the, yeah, two, 2020 can't get any, any more weird, can it, in terms of, you know, we won the 1920 season in the 2021 season. Mm. It's, 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 it's not madness. It's, you know, it's a kind of competition and it was something we wanted to win. But it's a great bit of silverware. Uh, and uh, you know, I watched it on Tuesday and was really impressed with what I saw from a, a very you know, a young Wimbledon team. Should we have been allowed to wear our new kit? Should we not have worn last season's kit because it was last season's competition? Well, this is the thing, isn't it? But then I also ran the rules of there were, play- I think, I believe there were players from Rotherham who couldn't play because they were overage now. So I, felt, I don't think the age thing, that, I may be corrected, but I believe there were, I read a report from Rotherham who said that there was a, a younger side because, of course, this is the under 18 for this season. Yeah. playing in last season. You know, I spent, you'll laugh at this, I spent the whole half wondering how good our goalkeeper was. I was thinking, crikey, he's two-footed. It, was, it did look very similar to Matt Cox. But I thought, well, he's pretty too old now to play in that. I, actually, it was him. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, it was really interesting. So, so he's he still qualified. Um, but, yeah, I think it was a case that because they were playing this season's under-18 team, they could play in in the kit. Although the squad numbers were all over the place, weren't they? Um yeah, uh, 43, 77, 66 is. Um, I believe, from my understanding, is that they've got kit, they've got squad numbers this year. I think the first available kit was a number was 43. You mean um, first so team squad numbers, like first we registered with the though, FA? Which I, you know what, I quite like the idea of that actually, because it's that sort of um, inclusive thing, isn't it? I quite like that. Um, the only thing is, when you haven't seen the, I haven't seen a lot of the U team, I'll be truthful, um, not as much as I used to. Um, I spent a lot of time going onto our official site to try and match up pictures with players to work out who they were. So, um, yeah, I don't mind. But yes, I think that's why they wore this season's kit. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. No, I, I, I jest, of course, of course I do. But uh, one nil victory, and let's have it out, Stu, as I did on Twitter on Tuesday evening on social media. Let's have this conversation. However, we're going to preface this or preface, however you want to pronounce that word, this conversation by saying that Stu has an opinion, I have an opinion, and by the end of this, neither of us would have changed our minds, but let's have the conversation anyway. <laughs> Stu, the winning goal was an own goal. Try and argue out against that. It was clearly carried over the line by the goalkeeper. Well, you and I normally agree on certain things, but for some reason you've gone rogue on this one. Um... Uh, I speak in favour of truth. <laughs> that is my only goal. So for, for any of you who have not seen it, where have you been? Um, have a look at it. It's on YouTube and I think it's on a lot of Twitter pages. But um, Matt Cox um, cleared the ball. Um, you've probably seen it many, many years ago when um, goalkeepers have done this thing. Paul Robinson did it from memory properly. Or, but Watford. basically, it, yeah, it, boun- it bounced high. It kicked up off the off the grass and went over the keeper. A keeper scrambling towards his net. 
And it's the argument, isn't it, of, you know, does he take it over the net or does he, in a movement, fall with it over the net? Um, I, my, I've always been an opinion that if uh, an own goal is if a ball is deflected that's going wide of a target, on target, or if it's deliberately a deliberate act in terms of someone's kicked it towards their own goal and it's gone in. Um, I, that's the reason I'm going to give it to Matt Cox, because if people are saying it, 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 he stopped the ball, I don't think he ever did. His momentum was always scrambling back into the goal, wasn't it? And I think my attitude is his momentum took him all the way in, but it was a movement. It didn't deflect. It didn't change the direction of the ball. The ball never changed direction. He never really had control of it properly. And in the end, he scrambled and embarrassingly, bless him, um, dragged it over his own line. Um, and my other argument is, is that that goalkeeper ain't going to want to claim it. He ain't going to be going up and saying, can I have that own goal, please? So officially, it will always go down as Matt Cox goal. I understand the goalkeeper, the Rotherham goalkeeper, will not want that to go down as an own goal. As you say, you don't want to claim it. But the Draper family doesn't want to claim Chris as one of ours. But we can't uh, go, go, go against fact. <laughs> so we have to just deal with it. And if the goalkeeper had got to the ball as he did to prevent the ball going over the line, and instead of it coming out and bouncing off his leg and then going in, it had bounced off a recovering defender and gone in, you'd, that would be an own goal. So why is it because it hits against him again, is it not an angle? It's all about momentum, isn't it? I believe in momentum. He was scrambling. He was always off balance because, of course, he was caught out last minute panicking. He was always travelling towards his own goal. And goalkeepers is always a difficult one. I'm not a great lover of goalkeepers being given own goals. I really am not. Um, because argument, you know, there's loads of arguments. It could be that a goalkeeper gets a hand to a ball, a strong hand, but it goes into the bottom corner. Is that then classed as an own goal. Do you know what I mean? A keeper is a different is a different role in the game, isn't it? But if he gets hands to the ball but he doesn't but he the ball doesn't change its direction of travel, then no. But on this occasion the ball has clearly on two occasions changed the direction it's travelling in. It's going towards the goal, then it's going away from goal and then it's going back towards goal. Yeah, but that's because a keeper can use his hands. Isn't it? I feel that's a little bit of a you know, he was scrambling, trying to get it. He never had it under control. He never had out of control. I don't think I ever saw him stop with the ball and then all of a sudden roll over. He was all it was a one movement because he's always scrambling going back towards it. And, and it's one of those, isn't it? The pace he was going at, he was never going to be able to stop and then you know clear it on the line. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I, I think Joe. You know what normally defenders are quite happy to give them own goals because it's deflected or comes off a shin or whatever like that. The goalkeepers, I've seen a lot of goals being given to goalkeepers and goals, and it just feels like, is it really? Um, you know, that sort of side of it. And I don't have to say, I don't think they wants it. Um, and for, as far as I know, it's gone down officially as Matt Cox's goal. So that sort of means I'm right. It has gone down officially as a Matt Cox goal, but lots of things go down officially that we know are not <laughs> true. But we won't put it that thread just now. My last point on this one was if that had been, if the Rotherham goalkeeper was the Milton Keynes goalkeeper and that was a Milton Keynes team and it had been a Swindon town player that had played the role of Matt Cox, we'd have all been pointing and laughing and mocking the Milton Keynes goalkeeper and saying it's an own goal. Of course. Yeah. Because that's what so the most... truth is the truth is what the truth is what you were having yourself. No, because in terms of them, you want anything to be, you know, you want everything to laugh at them. You don't care about them. You know, I have a lot of deep sympathy with their goalkeeper. You know, nobody wants to lose a final, let alone, no, absolutely. you know, that sort of side. However, if it was a Milton Keynes goalkeeper, I'd laugh my head off and retweet it for like the next 20 years. It would be hilarious. Um, I sort of like, you know, I did, I suppose, I suppose in a way, maybe it is emotion that gets involved with me on the decision because I don't really want that keeper to feel like he's got his, team the final because you know they had to be fair we wrong had chances to score and so did we but um yeah if it's a Milton Keynes player then yeah all day long it doesn't get away with that if it had been David De Gea what would the papers say well yeah but again they don't really like him do they do you know what I mean it's, 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 it's all it's, subjective this it's is my point agen- yeah it's papers with agendas isn't it it's you know we, we all see that don't we but um yeah, anyway, it was, it was a great goal by, by the keeper. Um, it, was on, it was on target. Um, yeah. uh, the funny thing is, is that 
he looked really embarrassed, didn't he? And I think the goalkeeper's union is quite strong, isn't it? Where mm. nobody mm. wants nobody wants that to happen. You know, he's glad that he's won a final. It's a great bit of silverware. Um, but the goalkeeper's union doesn't really, you know, felt a bit for him. Um, but yeah, look, a great win. One nil away. Looked good. There's some decent players in there. Um, so, you know, I've heard a lot about the academy and it looks like we've got another good group underneath us. Um, and see obviously what you know how many of those I think we always have to be careful with, with academy players because we can sometimes dig them up it's a big step it's a big step up into the first team but it's probably something that we're going to have to do more and more now um, especially as we go into a period where we might have to have bigger squads potentially well we will come on to that very very shortly but let's not move on just yet because as we are talking about great own goals and um, what is the greatest own goal you've ever seen Stu? I have my answer. Mine's quite an easy. Greatest own goal. Cool, you caught me with that one. Um, yeah, you've seen live and in person because the greatest own goal ever is either <laughs> Jamie Pollock from Manchester City, where he looped over the striker and then tried to head it back to his keeper and it went over him and in, or the uh, whoever it was that tried to overhead kick a clearance and hit it straight into his face and it bounced him. I can't remember who that was. I don't know. The, the best one I've seen live. I can't off the top of my head think of what. What if you just? Is that you thinking of? Are they? No, I the one no because the one that I was live to see in person was Alan Reeves against Villa in front of the Homestale Road end, where with no Aston Villa player in the eighteen yard box, a cross comes in and he decides to try and for some reason drop kick it into the goal, uh, <laughs> volley it straight past. I imagine it was Paul Heald at the time. It would have been, wouldn't it? Um, mm. Yeah, no, top of my head, I can't remember. Own goals. The thing is, own goals are great, aren't they? Because they're they're basically cheap goals. They're basically cheap. You haven't done much to we get the own goal, have you, or anything like that? Um, so they're always they're always comical to laugh at, aren't they? Um, but yeah, Alan Reeves. Well, what's he doing now? Crikey, it's been a little while since Alan Reeves has been um, yeah, around, doesn't it? It's a name a name from the past. Yeah, not the too distant past, of course, but yeah, I don't know what he's up to. He's up to now. There was, of course, the Viking Greenford, where the goalkeeper just let it roll under his foot. Um, but yeah. But then that was a comedy league, wasn't it? There were so many things that happened in that. That combine counties and God, some of the things that we saw, you were never, ever going to see repeated. No, um, no, certainly not. Uh, speaking of things that won't be repeated, who was the last Wimbledon player to score in that before Tuesday night, whether it was an own goal or Matt Cox's goal? Who was the last Wimbledon player to score in that goal? At Rotherham's ground, the New York Stadium. Quezzy Apaya penalty, wasn't it? It was indeed. Quezzy Apaya. Who's now in India now, I believe. Is that right, India? He's, he's, he's abroad somewhere. Um, Brexit means Brexit, Stuart. I don't care. Like n- Nothing outside of our borders means anything anymore. I think those old countries will just cease to exist now, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where he's gone, but he is, he's no longer playing, playing his trade on these on these shores and um, to, to link to an earlier point, Stuart, yes, reliance on the academy is going to be very important because uh, in the short, medium future, we're going to really struggle for funds in which to post a playing budget. So we will need to rely on producing our own and um, not paying ludicrous salaries. I don't know why I suddenly thought about that anyway. Um, you mentioned, Substitutes and needing academy to fill up places in the squad. What is the latest news on EFL and substitutes? If you're looking for a call out this week's listeners, uh, take your pick, really. Just pick someone at random that you don't like. Um, Troy Deeney. Anyway, Stu, go on. Um, <laughs> substitutes Troy, Deeney's doing his best to, Troy Deeney's doing his best to try and get away from Watford and be a journalist now, isn't he? He's at, he's at the press playing Watford. Do you know um, what? The, the, the bar of being a journalist has been set at Clinton Morrison. <laughs> It's not a high bar. <laughs> Very true. That guy, that, that guy never tells me anything different to what I know. Hey, I'm easy to pay for it as well. Um, yeah, so on Wednesday afternoon, uh, EFL, um, well, the clubs in EFL had a vote on increasing to five subs, which was used in the Premier League last year in the season. And it was, um, I, mean, you know, I don't even think it's old. How many people want? You know, I don't. I think it was unanimous. I don't think there was many teams that didn't want to do it. So, as of um, tonight's game, as we get out on Friday, um, five substitutes can be used. Um, still, a maximum of seven players that are allowed on the bench for League One and League Two. Different for the Championship. 
they're allowed nine players and they can have five substitutions. Um, so I don't, again, I'm not too sure in terms of the rules of it. I know you can't do all five subs at one time from memory in the, you know, the last season in the Premier League. They had certain times, didn't they? Which we, I think if we remember, we had that um, funny situation where the Brentford manager come out with his little uh, magnetic um, formation uh, thing. Do you remember? Um, and I think they said it was too big, so he got a smaller one. <laughs> I think if he'd gone any smaller, he'd gone into his iPad. Um, but it's, it was it, it was classed as technical timeouts, wasn't it? Right. Um, so we haven't seen it in League One or League Two, so we don't know how we are going to utilise it. Um, but I think it will. It's interesting because you're bringing it in after, I think most teams have played 11 games, 12 at a push. It does change the, it does change the landscape definitely does change it. Those two extra subs will make the games different in terms of levy longer games, longer injury time. Um, technically, you can replace half the team, out, you know, half the outfield, outfield players. Um, so it's a really weird one coming in. Um, cause we, and I suppose the argument is in the Premier League, it did, it did help the big teams. I remember Tottenham, Man U and Man U, basically born Fernandez, Pogba, and someone else's subs at 70 minutes and change the whole game. Ridiculous. I don't know whether that's going to do much in League One, League Two. You could argue Pompey. It would always favour the bigger clubs. The bigger teams, but I don't know if they actually do. You know, Sunderland, it probably would improve. Um, but it's interesting how you look at it now. I suppose it's a. Di- I suppose if you're, if you're a player, I imagine a player would be thinking, do you know what? That's great news for me because I've got more chance of getting on the pitch. You know, some players have deals where they get money per performance you know they get onto the pitch and stuff like that you could argue the academy players may benefit from it because they may get on so there's some bits of, around it but I think one thing that I think I'm quite certain on is that once it's in it ain't being scrapped next season it'll be it'll be continuous I believe yeah these things as is always the case once the gate is opened it lets the flood come through and time and time again as I said to you we will see this it will favor for me it will favor the big clubs it's also it i get the reasoning behind it of course i do but when you've got clubs that haven't been affected by covid19 it gives them a huge advantage yeah it does it does i think it may it'd be interesting how it goes because it may mean clubs might look at academy i think some so from memory you can name a squad of 21, I believe, this year, 21 or 22 players. Mm-hmm. However, any academy players or homegrown players don't count. So you can have them in your allocated wage cap squad. Um, so you may, because technically it means you're going to be able to have 16 players are going to be able to potentially have a run out on a, on a Saturday or Tuesday. Um, so it might mean teams might look at their academy. It will change the landscape. It's a big change. You know, if you think about that, we went from one sub to two subs to three subs. Remember, we've we've done that. We've done that sort of journey. It's a big a two subs is a big change to the game. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how we go about it. I want to go back to the days of two subs and a goalkeeper on the bench, and yeah, you'd have to have disappointed squad members who just didn't get a game that week and just play in the reserves on the Wednesday night. Gander Green Lane against Spurs with Ian Walker in goal, getting non-stop abuse for 90 minutes, which on reflection, you know, quite sad actually. But anyway, um, how uh, how is this going to benefit us in particular over the coming week? Because we have not played games for a couple of weeks because of a positive test or tests of COVID-19 within the playing squad. So all our games were postponed, but talk about coming back with a vengeance. There's no lead up to this there's no breaking us back into the season gently is there no so my understanding is the players have been um isolating at home uh, we were chatting beforehand weren't we in terms of we believe they should still be able to do um general fitness so go out for a run bike ride stuff like that but it's a two-week break it's kind of ways looking at it you know we were looking a bit ragged a bit tired so you know does it help you know if i look at if you compare to teams that have had breaks recently, Accrington had a, an enforced break, but they've come back and hit the ground running. So there are different ways of looking at it. Um, but I believe we, we believe the players are back on training on Thursday. 
we have a hell of a week, a hell of a week, you know, in terms of we go to Rochdale, which is what Greater Manchester, Gillingham, which is in, um, in G- Gillingham is in Kent. So not too Amazing. Far. Sorry. No, I'm not letting that one go. <laughs> Gillingham is in Gillingham. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I was going to, do you know what? I was going to say something um, funny, but I thought I'd better be serious because um, you can't really keep saying it. They, they wheels have, their house have wheels. You can't keep saying that all the time. Do you know what I mean? It's not funny. Is it? Um, and then, of course, we go up to Barrow, um, which is ridiculous. Barrow midweek on a Thursday, after already playing two games the previous four days. So, um, I had a quick look. Just in, you know, I was curious how much travel are we going to be doing. So, if you look at all the miles that we will be travelling over the next three away games, it totals eleven hundred and sixty-two miles, which is equivalent to eighteen and a half hours. So, I don't think we are travelling by coach the whole way. I think we'd probably be doing train at Barrow, potentially train at Rochdale. However, you know, travelling is going to be absolutely ridiculous. And just to give you a bit of an idea, you know, how far is 1160 or miles? Well, you could technically go from Wimbledon Plough Lane to Rome in one go, and that would be just under 1100 miles. Um, the, the five subs are going to help us. There's no doubt about that. We're going to have to really be sensible how we use our subs. One thing I would say, though, with any benefit we've got, is Barrow also had games on Saturday and Tuesday midweek. So the Barrow game, there is no real advantage for Barrow apart from being at home. Um, but they do have the same games as us. Um, but the FA Cup, you know, of course, if we win the FA Cup game, we play three days later at home to Crawley. Madness, madness at the moment. You're making me look up the League One table to see how things have gone because I am so out of the loop on all of this stuff. I don't even know. Like, it doesn't feel like we've not played for two weeks. It doesn't feel like we've played for months. Um, yeah. So where are we currently in the table? 13th. I, I think, do you know what? Mm. I think the, the madness thing was is that we had the, I wouldn't say euphoria, but we had the the pleasing situation of us playing in Plough Lane, a first game, you know, and get a two or draw against Doncaster and thinking, right, OK, we've now got Plough Lane, it's going to be, you know, continue to be growing. And then all of a sudden we got two days later of a COVID outbreak, outbreak um, which is concerning because, you know, that, that could hit many... People say our oh, players are fit, but we have to remember there's a lot more than just players around. There's the background staff and so forth like that. So I think that was a bit of a downer, wasn't it? It's sort of just gone quiet for two weeks. So, yeah, it has been difficult to remember where we are in the league. We're, we're doing all right, you know, 13, 13 14 points after 11. Um, we're OK. Um, but, you know, yes, we've got Rochdown, who they, they were bad to start with, but they picked up recently. Um, Gillingham hit and miss. I think Gillingham got such a young team. It is very much hit and miss with them in terms of what Gillingham team turns up. Yeah, I'm just looking at where they... Where they are, a um, couple places below us, they would go above us if they was not beat us. Uh, Rochdale, that is a real mixed bag. They are three without a win, and we are one win in five. Um, so, yeah, it's just really difficult. Uh, like I say, Stu, it's been a real struggle this season with everything else going on to keep on top of everything, to keep abreast of things, not really even following any of it, to be honest with you. I see Peterborough, our top hull just behind them, Ipswich up there. The teams you'd expect to be up there, really. Are there any surprises in the current top six? Peterborough, Hull, Ipswich, Charlton, Lincoln, Portsmouth, Sunderland and Fleetwood just outside the playoff places. No, it's it's gone really according to what you... Well, I say what you expect. I didn't put all those teams in the top six, but um, no. it's still it's still the case, isn't it, with no crowds. The games are definitely different. There's no doubt about that. Um, you can't argue. Lincoln, I would argue, that are probably not what I would have expected, but then you've got Matt, you've got Appleton at, um, at Lincoln, who's always done well wherever he goes, gets good loan deals, he's always got a good network. Um, Charlton sitting in fourth does surprise me. Um, there's still some funny on funny goings on at, um, at Charlton. Um, a giant, a giant I did see, which I think got um, got missed actually, was I was watching the Bristol Rovers highlights the other day, and little the little Turkish Messi turns up, off Zuma, is now on loan at Bristol Rovers. When that that went through, like so many deals have gone through, like you're thinking, what the hell? Um, although Bristol Rovers, of course, have lost their manager. Uh, he was a first casualty. 
um, of the season. Ben Garner, formerly of ASU Wimbledon, which was a real left field appointment. Oz Toomer are going to Bristol Rovers. Are a big, you're a big fan of theirs, aren't you? You love Bristol Rovers. No, I don't. It's quite funny seeing them. I tell you, know, I tell you what. When I watch the highlights, though, I don't, know, I don't. I don't think you've been watching many of them. But it's so sad when you see these grounds that you don't. I don't really like Bristol Rovers, but a big terrace behind a goal and it's empty. It's just. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. Um, but you know, there is there potentially could be some good news on the horizon in terms of uh, the, the government are potentially looking at once lockdown ends on the second of December that they are going to look at bringing fans into stadiums, but only at the tier, only for only for places that are in tier one or tier two. Um, so there might be some, there might be some hope, there might be some crowds in there. I didn't expect any crowds in until next season to be truthful. So it'll be interesting to see if that works. The crowds thing fascinates me. For one thing, first of all, it is an unfair advantage if you are a supporter of Milton Keynes because all of their fans can fit in that stadium socially distanced with a block each. So all of their fans can attend. Not the case for many other better supported clubs and well supported clubs. But I don't think I would like to go to watch a football. It still wouldn't be right for me to go and sit in a stadium where you're all sat with like a like a circle of, I don't know, 10 seats empty around you. And the next person's like five seats away. and You can't generate an atmosphere. It just yeah. becomes, basically it becomes midweek county cricket at that point where people are just going to watch and spectate and not actively engage in the atmosphere of what football is, it would be very strange. You see the photos when Brighton did trial this for pre-season friendlies. Yeah. I was like, mm, it didn't, did not appeal to me in any way, shape or form. If I want to go and watch football where there's no atmosphere and I'm totally detached from anyone around me, I'd go to Vicarage Road. I'd be a Watford fan, but I'm not. Well, obviously the argument, well, the argument that, yeah, a lot of MPs now are getting involved, especially definitely a Lincoln one as well, getting involved. I believe in, in the House of Parliament, he invited uh, Boris Johnson to maybe attend with him um, to a Lincoln game. I think Not Boris Johnson... Now, no, I think of all the places Boris wants to go, Lincoln ain't going to be the one he wants to go to, in all fairness. Um, but the reason they're giving it is because, of course, clubs are struggling. We still haven't yet done the deal, I don't believe. I don't think the deal's been done yet for the for all league. There's, I think there's still some negotiations to go on but for us you have to look at it and go would it really impact us because you're right what you're just saying um you know be social distancing but also we know that we've got a prioritization don't we so we know it's the ben- people to venture holders and non-refundable seating holders who get the first option if there's a limited attendance then the non-refundable season tickets and then the benches on their own um, which is the free tier <laughs> And I think we've done something in the range like two, two and a half thousand. So you might actually found that find that there's actually nobody can actually pay any additional money to get a ticket because that would be filled up by the non refundable scenes against the debentures. So for us financially, it isn't going to benefit us because that money's already been committed by the Wimbledon fans. I don't know how it's worked. I know I did listen to, oh, well, I listen to every week, I listened to the Darren McCanty. Um, and he said he's. they've had a lot of um, people asking for money back from season tickets, hmm. um, which is interesting, isn't it? Because you think fans didn't necessarily the end of last season, but um, it was interesting to hear that they've had people asking for money back. Not interesting because, of course, no one's made of money, but fans last year did, did forsake any refunds, didn't they? I am going to look up the statistic, Stu, to explain why fans are asking for refunds on season tickets. This is the beauty of live radio, which is not live for anyone listening. We could just stop talking and we could edit it. But no, that's too much effort. I don't have the time. So I'm going to look up. Yeah, this is much more fun as you listen to me pad horrendously as I try and find the current unemployment rate in the United Kingdom. 4.8%, 4.8%, a record 314,000 people lost their jobs in the three months to September. So we don't even know what's coming next. We don't know what awaits us when furlough ends in the new year. There is a huge financial economic crash heading our way. Peterborough will not be the first or last club 
to have fans saying, really sorry, I can no longer justify giving you this money because yeah. I've got to eat. It's a fair point as well because obviously furlough's been extended, isn't it? I think it's what, the end of November, March, is that right? Like March, sorry. Yeah. March, yeah. Um, but realistically, like I actually went out, I went out on Monday to see, obviously I'm in Crawley, so I went into Crawley and I was absolutely stunned by, of course, places are shut, non-essential shops are shut. However, I was stunned by the amount of places that were clearly not going to open again, you know, boarded up um, to let signs out of them. And it is just, it, it's, it sort of still brings it home. Um, big unemployment, Crawley's been affected massively because of Crawley is basically a, a feeder for Gatwick Airport. Um, you know, one lives in a certain radius. So Crawley will be impacted heavily, but it was an eye-opener. I think sometimes, you know, even though football is continuing, it's as if like it's a parallel universe that isn't affected yeah. by... We, we say, you know, people say that they are losing money. And I have to say, Karen Brady, who is an absolute plum, um, said the most amazing... So people would so say... It was said that clubs are losing loads and loads of money. And she tried to claim that um, West Ham were losing £10 million every game that they didn't have fans at. How does somebody get... It was just mind-boggling. It's actually they get roughly about four million pounds, um, I think, over a uh, games. But it's just the Premier League just don't really understand that what a financial struggle is. Um, and the clubs down the pyramid are starting. The, you know, the EFL are trying to broker a deal, aren't they? But the deal at the moment is twenty million pound of grants and thirty million pound of loans, which just seems pathetic. Why are you loaning clubs? As, and again, I'm not going to use Darren McCanty again, but he's the only one that's actually really talking out about this. He was like, why the hell would you want a loan when you can't afford to pay players salaries anyway? Yeah. You know, it's why would you take a loan? It's madness. And um, yeah, the unemployment's going to get worse and worse. And um, yeah, so in terms of people getting into grounds, potentially, I still, I still believe when I see it. Footballers are paid far too much money. Just want to put that out there. We're talking about you're talking about the sums of West Ham there. And I'm thinking of well, millions. I'm thinking the players that they they pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds a week, and it's a big, big problem. And as we've said, Stu, for many, many years, it's worse when the players are younger because they get huge salaries at far too young an age before they've really done anything to deserve them. It's a it's a complete a horrendously miss. I don't know what the word is. Miscued is the wrong word. But, yeah, the business has gone wrong, basically. Um, There's loads yeah. of things, isn't there? And recent examples have been in terms of Greenwood at Man U. Um, it's reported that his, you know, his head's turned. You know, he's also got into loads of money. He's, he's not training as well. And, you know, he's, he was a big thing coming in. All of a sudden, he's sort of gone to his head a little bit. Uh, Lingard as well, can't get into the team at Man U. Uh, a lot of these players... It's, and Roy King said it many a time before. They earn too much money before they even done anything. Yep. Um, and that is the case. Fogden with Man City, you know, in terms of um, obviously the situation that happened on international duty, they, they seem to think they're above it all. Um, and the COVID thing is really interesting. There were 16 players that tested positive in the last round of testing because of Premier League test every week. And that mm. didn't include the international players because they're still due to be tested. But you've already seen in terms of Mo Salah, went to someone's wedding, um, caught COVID. You just sit there and go, you're not immune to this. It's, it does seem in a no. way, you know, we say football is great, you know, football must continue because it will give, it will help fans. Does it really, when you're seeing people that are paid loads and loads of money blatantly, they're, they're tested all the time, you know, it's, it does make a mockery sometimes, doesn't it? It's a wind up for me. That's why I'm not watching it anymore because it actually does. It just winds me up. It winds me up. It, and do you know what, Stu? We talk about at the start of the show. I didn't do a call out. And I said pick someone at random. Actually, because I don't think we've done it this season, I should call out a VAR once again. Because amongst all these other problems, football at the highest level is just a wind up. Like as I say, total, like you say, these players that think they're immune from what's going on because they've been allowed to think they're immune because everything is geared towards them and making their lives as easy as possible as it can possibly be, including getting paid ludicrous amounts of money. And they get to continue to do their jobs whilst other people can't, not even the Prime Minister for some obscure reason, but Premier League footballers can. And then on top of that, we have VA 
fucking are. And the and create, I said this before the podcast, you. I'm really sorry if you get bored of me, listeners. I'm really sorry if you follow me on Twitter and get bored of me talking about these things. But oh my good god, automation! It is going to be. A, it's going to. Well, it's going to be. Oh, it's just. I can't even go into it. It's I find VAR it funny. I find it but, funny though, because it's, it's so. Just, it's so bad. It's but it's so bad. But people people clamour to have it. Like, no, surely, surely. Oh, I could get so philosophical right now. But surely everyone not realising one of the biggest problems of lockdown has been loneliness, which cannot be cured by Zoom or text messages or social media. It doesn't. You need human face-to-face interaction. But everything we're doing, including VAR, which will get rid of linesmen to begin with, and eventually referees will get robot referees, like Will Smith and I, robot. It's just, we just seem to dehum- dehumanise everything. <laughs> and it's making people really depressed and unhappy. Yeah, and I and I said this I said this to you a little while ago, didn't I? About football returning, I was strongly of the believer that I didn't believe we should have returned, and that was because financially I thought it was, it was stupid too. But of course, there was TV deals. But mental health is such a big issue, and you're right. There are people that cannot go to work. So if you work in retail, you cannot go to work. Uh, I saw a documentary which was just unbelievable. It was on, um, I think it was Channel Four. Was it Panorama? No, it was Channel. It was. It was Actually, I think it was Panorama on BBC One, and they basically had a a, a, wait, a waitress job, or a waiter job, sorry. A thousand people applied for it. Um, they got down to the two people, um, and they had to do a trial. So they both had to work. They were both desperate. One guy, basically, if he didn't get a job within a month, he would lose his, he would be able to afford his rent. That's a big lot of pressure. Looked like he was successful, and then a day just before they were about to make the announcement, who got the job? Bear in mind, this is a job at you know working. You know, what, what's it called? Living wage now. Um, Boris Johnson said, "No, you know, you're gonna have to close down for a month," and the job was no longer available. Yeah, I mean, that's just insane. <laughs> um, but to see the mental, this this guy that had been one of the guys, he was, um, I think he was a manager at a hotel. He was basically saying he went back to university life in terms of beans, tins of beans and pop noodles and super noodles. And the fact that he wouldn't be able to afford his rent in December if he didn't get a job. And he went for a job that had a thousand people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mental health is a big problem. And I do have a problem with footballers at the moment. The Tramadie is a joke. Um, I just think, you know, they're living in a different world. And um, I love my football, but I also understand a lot about mental health and stuff at the moment. Yeah, and it's not really football related, but the mental health thing is such a big thing for me. And it's still, we still, despite what people say, are not talking about this anywhere near enough. And it's a huge wind up. So many services that are amazing, do amazing jobs in the community, are essential. They're far more essential than playing Premier League football, but they are deemed non essentials. They have to shut. People don't understand what a vital role things like libraries play in our communities for many, many people. That is their only source of human interaction for days at a time. It's gone. We just don't understand. We've got all so priorities so muddled in this country. So yes, listeners, no, I'm not watching any football. Um, it, it's just a wind and, up. And George, just to go on that, obviously we did the Don's Trust Hustings this weekend. Yes. Gone. I actually really enjoyed it. And I, I didn't enjoy it because, you know, sometimes talking about, governance and that can be a bit boring but it was what? so great surely not no but it was so i've great. seen those don't trust meetings attended by thousands <laughs> but it's it like mardi so, gras it was so great to have an event that actually had a lot of people that i class in the wimbledon family do you know what i mean we were friends and we were friends in, in you know wimbledon and stuff and it was great to to see some of them at the standing obviously we were able to have a laugh and and you know aaron joined us with the most ridiculous hairstyle ever um, how he's ever going to give George grief, grief or I never know. But I actually, it really, it really did. sounded like you said George Grease, and I thought, George weird Greece. hair thing going Greece. on there. Um, <laughs> but I don't know about you, but it actually cheered me up. You're right, Zoom isn't great for, you know, you do need that human contact. But the next best thing is something like that. And it was really enjoyable, um, but few and far between at the moment. Very true. And yes, but actually a fantastic segue for us to remind listeners about the Don's Trust election, which is ongoing and votes can be cast up until the 5th of December, 11.59pm on the 5th of December. We conducted hosting interviews, as Stu says, on Sunday last Sunday. Um, Sunday last Sunday, yeah. Sunday last Sunday, 
sounds like a song title um or captain my captain that's what it sounds like <laughs> um you can watch all of those Stu put those together in record time following the live broadcasts on a zoom webinar which was very well organized and put together by george so credit george yes. you are you can keep your job for this week and then Stu went about editing them all on youtube so you can go and watch all of 11 candidates interviews on there and then we are looking for five vacancies to be filled so you can you can vote for up to five people a maximum of five but it doesn't have to be five you could vote for three if you wanted to you could vote for two if you wanted to it's up to you but maximum it was a tough one to pick there's some really good candidates very difficult really Really good candidates and i have to say um freddie flaxman was just the most hilarious one i've ever ever done george should have been sacked because basically freddie had to get up at like 4 30 in the morning um but it was when i just introduced it and i said obviously you know you're in a different time zone and then it, that american accent come out it was um but an interesting uh, you know an interesting character a lot of people that probably have not been on people's radars or don't know necessarily much about um it was a really big eye-opener on sunday and um it looks like the Don's trust board is still in very capable hands we should have got Jeremy Paxman to interview because then we could have done like Paxman meets Flaxman and I'd have been <laughs> amused for all of 30 seconds. <laughs> amused for all of 30 seconds is the title of my sex tape. There you go, listeners. I got in there first before you could. Um, but that's it. I think, do we have anything to add for the Don's Trust hustings? No? No. Like I say, um, take advantage of, um, if you haven't voted yet, please have a look at the the videos on the podcast as well in case you're on your way to work or you prefer listening to a podcast but they're really good and i think you know we try to give them as much as a hard time as possible but they were very good answers and um it'd be interesting to see who is successful um and hopefully the ones that have not been successful can continue in some format because there's going to be some good ones that don't get in you know don't get onto the board and um it'd be a shame to lose that, that energy and skills that they have I'm really sorry. Try to give them as much of a hard time as possible, title of your sex tape. Updates from Rochdale on Saturday will be on uh, Twitter at 9YRS Podcast. Uh, Back to Planning Live is scheduled on the club's official Facebook. But um, how can I forget, Stu, before I normally do that little ending to the show, we have our game to play. How have I oh, of course. How did we forget that? I think you're going to like it. I have got a prediction that you will get 100% this week. No, do not. I'm rubbish on squad numbers. You know that. Yeah, but I think you'll get. I think you'll get these ones. I'm, like I'm so one? confident. No, we've done number. Have we done number one? <clears throat> How have we not done number one? Because probably because it'll be far too easy. That would be uh, right. No, I'm going to do number three this week. Oh, oh no, oh no. It's, yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay. Ninety-five, ninety-six. Oh. So you're going to tempt me in, but I know Thatcher was six no. at one point. Do not overthink this. Do not overthink any of this. 95, 96, number three. Ben Thatcher. No, it's not Ben Thatcher. It's Alan Kimball. I did say Ben Thatcher. It's Alan Kimball. <laughs> We're going to ignore the fact that Ben Thatcher didn't play for us in 95, 96. Okay? Oh, We're going to move swiftly it's on. It's all a blur. 2000 and 2001. Oh. Do That's not really overthink this. Do not that was overthink a it. Season. That was a relegation season, wasn't it? First season after relegation. Oh, I can't remember who was in the team. Um, Hawkins. Okay. I don't know. I didn't. I, do you know what? That season, I didn't pay much attention. No, nor did anyone else. They would turn it back, to be fair. Well, that was the, yeah. Anyway, that was season after. But yes, okay. You're going for Peter Hawkins? Yeah, I think so. All right. 2015, 2016. Think about this. You'll get there so easily. I forget who played last season. Let me have a little think. 2015-16 was the year we won promotion at Wembley. Oh, who was the left? Barry Fuller was the other side. Oh, my days. My mind has gone blank. I can probably name all the other players that are in it. Oh, um, Callum Kennedy. There we go. I don't remember because I remember Bayo. And exactly. then you have the argument. Yes. I know, but you forget. It's not as... It, yeah. I don't... It's so difficult with squad numbers nowadays. But I'm better with this season's squad numbers. And that's mainly down to Back to Power Lane Live, which I've been doing the graphics for. And, of course, I have to remember their numbers. So I'm better this year with with their numbers. Okay. If that helps. 
Well, you still you got two out of three. I know. I don't know who the hell was left back at that season. Um, I'll give you a clue. He was the same person that was the left back in ninety five, ninety six. Oh, did, did he stay that long? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's why. Thankfully, he had the initials AK, but he didn't like the Fulham player. Decided to have a squad number forty seven. I mean, cheap for the love of God, honestly. <laughs> My word. I mean, the, the game's numbers, gone. Eh? Game's gone. I'm oh. surprised. But did it? Wasn't that? Wasn't there a player we spoke about? Wasn't it? Who had like um, a radio station's number no, on his yeah. back? Yeah, I'm surprised that's was. not been done more often. Because I think radio stations are pretty much. I don't know. Like ninety-seven point three or ninety-five point eight. But how many people like, actually listen on old school radio these days? Like, yeah, you just press true. a button on your device now, and it takes you to wherever you want to go. Or you talk to Alexa. Well, yes. Wouldn't we all love to do that? Wouldn't we all love to spend our days talking to Alexa Bliss? Uh, I get confused, though. I get confused, Nick, because I, I have a Google Echo. Well, that's a... a what? Don't do it. Yeah, I know you can do that. No, I have, I have the Google Echo within my TV, so that's an Android, so that's a Google. And then I have two Alexas. Right. So I get confused. Oh, wow, I'm so jealous. And also, the thing is, I have two Alexas, one in the bedroom, one in the kitchen. And sometimes I talk to Alexa. <laughs> it just gets better and better. I, <laughs> I mean, talk to Alexa we're in the very, so we have to say, we're a very modern thinking podcast, but there we go. <laughs> Stu's got his two Alexas in the bedroom <laughs> and the kitchen. But sometimes I will, I will ask Alexa to do something in the kitchen, like do a timer, and my Alexa in the bedroom starts doing a timer. So is it Alexa 1, Alexa 2? And then if I watch TV, if someone says Google, my Google starts trying to recognise my voice. It's a big problem, technology. Technology is good, but sometimes it can be bad. Uh, no, I think I, have, I am increasingly of the opinion that it's pretty much all bad. And I think we were all happier in the, in the 80s. When did society reach its peak? Where, where were we at our actual peak? I would say like, I would say 98, I think. I think it was all downhill after that. Yeah, I, draw, I think it's the day before mobile phones, so I can't remember when the mobile phones come in, but I still say this to my nephew sometimes, I would go to a pub to meet a friend, and they didn't turn up. That was all right. I, I spoke to somebody else. I spoke to somebody. I didn't go on my phone and text other people or look at it on Facebook. I just spoke to anyone else that was there, that, basically, because I couldn't phone anybody. How often do you go down to a pub and your friend not turn up? There was a couple of occasions, although they were late. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, well, yeah. But you couldn't, you couldn't phone, you couldn't phone, do you know what I mean? Like, no. I think it was so much, oh, I say so much better than I, I, I do rely on my phone for quite a lot, but that's, that's because that's just natural, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? But, you know, the days of, you know, the days of team news, like, who ever phoned Team Talk? Was it the 98 number? Do you remember to get the latest news? Like, these people nowadays don't know that. We digressed. I mean, there's lots of un- unnecessary things as well. Like, back in the day, <laughs> You would go to football, you would watch the game of football in front of you, you get the half-time scores over the PA, but then you wouldn't know the full-time scores until you got back into the pub or in your car and heard it on the radio or saw it on TV. And do you know what? We were fine with that. We didn't need Sky Sports soccer app on the phone where we'd be like, oh my good God, Swindon have scored at crew. I'm like, I don't care. I literally don't care. How many people have missed goals because they've been looking at latest scores from other games on their mobile device. Yes, device. this is true. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I had a really interesting... You'll laugh at this. I was, when I was at QPR for the Plymouth game, in the press area, we obviously I had my iPad, which had scores on. I also, we also had a TV screen above us, which had Sky so Soccer Saturday on. And we had, a, we had a game, obviously, in front of us on the pitch. Yeah, I didn't know where to look half the time. No. And if it was going off, and it was just like, a bit confusing. <laughs> Can't make that joke again. I've made it too many times on the podcast, <laughs> but everything was going off and it was just confusing. Uh, you know what to look at next? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's probably. I think this is podcast overboard by this point, so we should probably wrap <laughs> it up. Um, thank you very much for joining us. To say Twitter updates, look for those on at Nine Wires Podcast and back to play on live on the club's official Facebook feed when football should return on saturday but that is it for us for this week Stu, thank you very much for joining me no problem <clears throat> just the one alexa bliss bag first milk last two plus two 
continues to equal four. And we will speak to you again next Friday.